Yeah. Just to send us uh, real quick, and I'll be with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are alive now. So, ok, boa tarde a todos. Sejam bem-vindos a mais um webinar da Associação Brasileira de Eletrônica de Potência, a Sobra App. Uh, meu nome é Sérgio Vidal, sou o primeiro secretário da nossa associação nessa administração 2020. 2021, que tem a presidência do professor Marcelo Mesaroba, da UDESC Joinville. É, eu também estou vinculado ao UDESC Joinville. É, hoje aqui teremos é, é, a participação do nosso vice-presidente, professor Demircio Oliveira, é, da Universidade Federal do, de, do Ceará, em Fortaleza, é, que fará alguns, é, trará alguns informes a respeito da nossa sociedade. É, eu gostaria de iniciar oficialmente esse webinar, uh, primeiramente agradecendo uh, os nossos patrocinadores, né, que sem os quais eh, esses eventos ficariam muito prejudicados ou até né, impossibilitados. Né? Então, a Omni, a PHB Solar, a Supplier uh, e a Tektronics, esse evento também, além da, do oferecimento por parte da Associação Brasileira de Eletrônica Potência, ele tem o suporte do é, Comitê Técnico de Eletrônica e Potência e Máquinas Elétricas da Sociedade Brasileira de Automática, né, onde nós temos membros da Sobraep é, atuando. E, dessa forma, eu gostaria, antes de fazer a apresentação do nosso palestrante, professor John Reyes, da Universidade de Cork, na Irlanda. Ele vai fazer a sua apresentação em inglês e a sua introdução também, a pedido dele. E Então, passo a palavra ao nosso vice-presidente, professor Demircio Oliveira. Por favor, professor Demircio, seja bem-vindo e sejam bem-vindos a todos. E, e boa tarde a todos. É... Sérgio, você pode dar uma checada no YouTube para ver se está ok, porque por aqui eu não estou conseguindo visualizar, tá? só dar uma checada aí. Uhum. É, e, e, e passa o compartilhamento da tela para mim, por gentileza. Ok, vamos lá. Primeiro, deixa eu torná-lo aqui apresentador, né? Uhum. Uh... Ok, então, boa tarde a todos. Deixa eu aproveitar para compartilhar minha tela aqui fazer alguns anúncios sobre a nossa revista em especial. Né? Então, eu é, só, só verificar, né? ver se está... Bom, só, então, só você não, uhum. não, não ter que... Porque aqui eu atualizei algumas vezes e aparentemente não carregou nada aqui no YouTube. Deixa eu pegar o nosso link novamente aqui. Opa. É, ele não está não tá online. Deixa eu ver aqui o que está acontecendo. Ok, estamos online. É... Agora sim. Uh, professor Demetrio, você pode, pode fazer a tua apresentação agora. Uh, professor uh, John, I think we need to correct the, the link that you sent to your friend. Uh, oh, ok. I, I Great. put in the, the share notes, I put in the public chat. You can check. Um, 
Eu sou demissivo à vontade. In the public chat. Uh, okay. That, uh, yep. Posso começar então, Sérgio? Pode, pode, por favor. Tá, então, boa tarde a todos. Eu vou repetir aqui nossos patrocinadores. Eu acho que não estava não funcionando naquela hora, né, Sérgio? Então, pois, primeiro... eu, eu acho que sim, tá? Porque o link, a princípio, é o mesmo, só porque aquela. Estava em upper case, né? É, talvez. Uhum. Mas, por favor, é, tá. se. Vamos repetir aqui. Eu vou agradecer mais uma vez. Não custa agradecer nossos patrocinadores, Textronic, a Omni. PHB Solar e a Supplier, que sempre estão aqui junto com a Sobaete. Então, eu quero anunciar aqui a, é, a nossa é, sessão especial nessa parte de é, Application of Power Electronics in Electric Mobility. A gente está com um deadline previsto aqui para o dia 31 de agosto, para ser publicado na última, no último número desse ano. Ok? E também, eh, em breve, a gente deve anunciar uma outra sessão especial em Falta Voltar. O professor Erivel está tá à frente dessa sessão especial e ele ainda está definindo eh, os tópicos e as datas com relação a isso. Ok? Em breve ter, teremos mais notícias. Né? E aproveitar aqui para fazer alguns comunicados que a Camila, uma das organizadoras do COBEP, que vai ter esse ano, desse ano. Eu, aqui. Isso, eu acho que você está com o é. teu. Seria bom tu mutar o, o teu canal lá do. Tá ah, sim, sim. É, verdade. É. Então, é, a Camila é, pede para a gente lembrar que vai ter o Coberto esse ano, vai ser em novembro, na primeira e segunda semana de novembro, certo? que é um maior evento aqui no, no Brasil, na área de eletrônica potência. Né, o, a primeira submissão é um resumo em inglês, certo? E depois vai ter uma versão final mais completa, ok? Para quem quiser indexar o trabalho no Interest Explorer, ok? A data de submissão é 24 de maio, então acho, acho que houve uma prorrogação nova aí, certo? É, a ideia é que o congresso seja em formato híbrido, ok? Eu, eu acredito que até novembro acho que já vai ser possível manter o presencial e o híbrido, Ok? em João Pessoa, que evidentemente é uma cidade é, maravilhosa, praia, calor, então depois de um fim de uma pandemia, eu acho que é um ótimo lugar para todo mundo ir, para a gente se encontrar. É, é, no, o, o site do evento, o spb.br barra cobep2021, o seu Instagram também, arroba cobep2021, certo? E, sim, lembrar também que é, os melhores trabalhos que foram publicados é, Nessa conferência, né, vão ser convidados aí a, a publicação de uma versão estendida na sua web. Ok? Bom, Sérgio, é isso que eu tinha que falar, então eu vou falar para você aí, obrigado. Ok, professor Demir Sil, uh, obrigado aí pela, pelas informações. Então, uh, sem mais uh, delongas, I would like to introduce professor John Hayes, from uh, University of Cork, Ireland. Professor John, on behalf of uh, our Brazilian Power Electronic Society, I would like to thank you for your time, for your knowledge, and uh, your av uh, availability to share uh, share it with us. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Sergio and Marcel. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, can I share screens here? Mm -hmm. right. Uh, right, there we go. So I, I, I think everybody can see my opening slide. So thank you. Thank you again, Sergio, and thank you, Demarcial, and greetings from Ireland. Uh, I uh, have been to your wonderful country once back in the late 90s, and um, it's great to be able to talk to you virtually. I'll This seminar, I just went through it yesterday, is about 50 minutes long. I'll probably, it'll probably end up being an hour. Uh, I'll happily take questions. I have lots of material, so feel free to ask questions. I guess we'll take the questions at the end of the seminar, Sergio. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm easy going. 
So my title of my seminar today is Electric Powertrain, Energy Systems, Power Electronics, and Drives for Hybrid, Electric, and Fuel Cell Vehicles. The, I'm sorry, a little on myself, uh, I am a senior lecturer here at University College Cork. My interests are energy systems, power and machines. More specifically, I'm probably a power electronics and magnetics person. Uh, I have found, I am, I've learned a lot about cars. My wife is a mechanical engineer from Detroit. So I say that I'm really married to the mafia in terms of the automotive world. I worked for 10 years in Los Angeles in the 1990s, from 1990 to 2000, on the first production electric car, which was the General Motors EV1. While, when I started working there that same month, uh, Abba Skidarzy uh, had started working there. He had come from a background in power electronics and machines as well, and had been working in wind power. He joined us at General Motors, which was used aircraft at the time, and he was the technical director for the development of the power electronics and the machines for the GM EV1. Abbas was to leave us in the mid 90s and he set up a company and a couple of more companies and he is currently the president and CEO and founder of US Hybrid. They specialize in heavy duty vehicles, 18 wheelers, 80,000 pound trucks, buses the works with hybrid powertrains or fuel cell powertrains. Uh, he's done a lot, uh, he's done a little bit of aerospace and a lot of other automotive work. So we, we've, we go back years, we stay in connection quite a bit and I tap his resources quite a bit to explain what's going on. A number of years ago, Abbas and I were talking on this and I'm of course now an academic and have been in academia for the last 20 years after 10 years in production of EVs. And what was becoming clear to us certainly in 20, in the early parts of the, almost 10 years ago was that we needed educational resources in order to explain and uh, I suppose um, spread the gospel on electric vehicles and why we need them and what the power trains are and what the options for sources, why we hybridize, why we use a fuel cell, what do we need to know about batteries. So we developed a, a textbook based on that that um, came on the market in late 2017 in the US in early 2018. The Chinese edition is just coming onto the market uh, any day now, it'll be this month. Uh, we did a, a a reprint, or sorry, a second print in October 2019 to to fix some errors in the book, but also to kind of bring up some new technology. And what's really fascinating is, even since we brought out the book three or four years ago, everything is exploding in this in this area. That said, it's a very simple set of technologies. All the technologies we go through today are, are the basic set that you need. So while the EV itself has got more publicity, while we've had a stock market bubble in all things EV, it's a very, in a way, simple set of technologies. So this book is a structured university teaching stream. I teach the first years, I've taught it second years, third years, seniors and postgrad uh, over the last three or four years. And we kind of holistically put it all together. I'm a power electronics and machines guy and magnetics guy. And what I didn't know, of us typically had, and what neither of us had, I probably really wanted to figure out. So we would have got a lot of help along the way, and I'll, I'll point out some of the places where we got that help. For academics like yourself, lots of examples, lots of problems, and lots of assignments. This is only going to be uh, less than an hour. For this past year's IEEE ECCE seminar, which uh, I can't even remember, oh, that would have been in Detroit, <laughs> my other hometown. Uh, I did a three hour and 15 minute seminar. That is up on the website as shown there. So if you want to, if you have more time and want to go through what I presented for ECC in uh, 2020 actually, 
you have the various uh, blocks there. And just to note what these blocks are, the very first part of the book is vehicle and energy sources. We discuss the motivations for the, the electromobile mobility and the environmental issues. We then go on to discuss the car. Now I call it um, vehicle dynamics. I could also call it mechanical engineering or automotive engineers for electrical engineering dummies, but it's a very good chapter. And I, I try to explain what we need to know there. Chapter three, I had to learn electrochemistry, batteries. Chapter four, Abbas manufactures these. Uh, so I, I built a lot in his work for, for the fuel cells. Chapter five, Abbas again is an expert in hybrid powertrains. And I'll talk a little bit about this. Now, in general, folks like us from Power Electronics, we do find the first part of this book the most interesting. Uh, the, the, the machines and the power electronics, we're all kind of comfortable with. But the automotive part is interesting. Even if I'm in Detroit giving a seminar from the book, I will tell whichever company, all the automotive companies, what would you like me to talk about? I can do power electronics, drives, machines, control. I'll often get asked, even in Detroit, to discuss the car. And what we find happens in our world and in the industrial world, we all end up in our niches and we don't necessarily know what's going on in the big picture. So what I'm addressing here at the start of the book is the big picture, the car, the energy sources, what's driving our power electronics and machines. The second part is electrical machines. I do a, a general introduction to traction machines. Uh, interestingly, I start with the DC brush motor. I'll explain why in a little while. And then I go on to the induction motor, which was the machine of choice for the GM EV1 and also for the Tesla products up until recently. I then discussed the surface permanent magnet AC machine. And after that, in the next chapter, the interior permanent magnet machine, the machine that's the machine of choice for 98% of EVs today. Then power electronics, which we all know and love, chapter in DC-DC converters, then isolated DC-DCs, uh, some more, a uh, nice chapter on traction drives, and I'll, I'll tell you what I kind of like about that. Uh, battery charging, I, um, I spent five years at General Motors on inductive or wireless charging. I spent five years on IGBTs and induction machines and drives. So I, I, I enjoy telling people about induction motors and inductive coupling or wireless charging. Uh, control of the drive is chapter 15. I'll just briefly refer to it here. Chapter 16 is what I teach to, to second years, and it's really all about electromagnetism, ferromagnetism, and electromechanical energy conversion. It's a lovely chapter. We won't spend any time on it today, but it's, it's, it's really what I suppose my, I, I really enjoy as well. On the Wiley website, which you can uh, access, there's a whole bunch of public domain publications Anything from the US federal government is in the public domain. So information there from the US National Labs publications or from the US uh, Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, are up there. Uh, any of my own publications, I also put up there. For assignments, we have some simple MATLAB, we have Simlink, uh, we have some FEA modeling. The FEA modeling is kind of, there's uh, IPA models and there is some inductor models. So again, it's it's a good starter if you want to get into the zone. I've also started about putting up simple labs for, for building circuits like a book or a boost. A lot of the adoption of the book would be in the electromechanical space or the mechanical space. And just even having a simple lab on a book converter or a boost converter to build up, up the flyback is, is very useful to, to really visualize what's going on and understand it on the bench. So at this point, there's only a book lab up there. I do have another boost lab and I have um, a book boost that I'm working on. They're very simple, but they're, they're very easy for students to do and to build. For instructors, uh, who register with Wiley, that's all that's required. There's a full set of lecture slides, many of, the, of which you'll see today, but there's several hundred lecture slides up there. And there's a full set of solutions. And if you have interest or you need help on courses or anything like that, you can just send me an email. Starting at the start, uh, part one, uh, so we go into chapter one, electromobility and the environment. 
So what we're doing here is introducing the electric powertrain and explaining how it compares and contrasts with the internal combustion engine. And we'll do a little bit of that in, in this next few slides. We're also providing a historical perspective. We talk about Henry Ford and Charles Kettering. And these days we would talk about Elon Musk and I talk about Musk a little. Uh, then uh, we do discuss a little bit of chemistry, which I think is wonderful, vehicle emissions and regulations. And that last part, regulations, is what's driving our business. And it is um, it's very impactful uh, it drove what we were doing in California back in the 90s and effectively what was happening in California and the, the push-pull factor, environmental factors there, are, have been propagating themselves around the world. And we can discuss that more as we go on. But I suppose at this stage, I'm 31 years into this business. Um, it doesn't go much, this, this current modern area probably goes a couple of years before that also in los angeles but it's uh, it's got quite a long uh time span uh, for at this time but it all goes back earlier it is very nice to think about what henry ford was thinking about now there's a a, a book on him or by him that came out in 1923 and he was reflecting at the time on what he was thinking in 1899. Now, Henry Ford was a big, was, was great friends with uh, Thomas Edison. He was, I, if I remember correctly, working for Detroit Edison. And so he, he knew the electrical world well. So now let's look at what he's telling us back in 1923, which is almost 100 years ago. Practically no one had the remotest notion of the future of the internal combustion engine while we were just on the edge of the great electrical development. I did not see the use of experimenting with electricity for my purposes. That is not to say that I held or now hold electricity cheaply. We have not begun to use electricity, but it has its place and the internal combustion engine has its place. Neither can substitute for the other, which is exceedingly fortunate. It was 1923. A hundred years later, we are questioning this thesis again. And the world is morphing and transforming, but it's a hundred years later. Henry Ford introduced the Model T in 1907. And the Model T, as we see in our car here, this is a lovely Model T from way back and three lady drivers are uh, there. It had a crankshaft. Uh, you can maybe see it in, in the front of the vehicle. And a challenge for the Model T at the time, or for any vehicle at the time, was cranking the engine was actually quite a dangerous operation. Uh, women particularly didn't like to do it, and it, it, it could throw out a shoulder or injure somebody. So there was a lot of, it wasn't clear that, that the internal combustion engine was the solution. In 1900, in the US, about half the cars sold were electric, and about half the cars sold were petrol or gasoline. Henry Ford introduced the Model T in 1907. The only challenge it really had, the main challenge was the cranking. But in 1912, uh, Charles Kettering, who was working for Cadillac, Cadillac, introduced the electric starter. So we didn't have to crank the engine anymore. We could turn the key on or press a button the battery, the, electric, the electrics would start the car and the engine would take off. And with that, we got the modern world. We got urbanization, we got highways, we got roads, we got cars that could travel long distances. Uh, and we got the modern, I suppose, hydrocarbon economy. Hydrocarbon was a word that uh, Thomas Edison used to like to use for fossil fuels. Interestingly, these developments killed the electric cars of the day. So within a relatively short number of years, the electric cars, which were quite competitive in 1900, had disappeared and were largely uh, niche applications uh, from there on. It's interesting to look at efficiency because we start to, to, to think about what are the challenges for our or, or hydrocarbon fuel in our vehicle. And so here I show a conventional uh, vehicle efficiency. 
Coming from the left, we have the well to tank efficiency. So that's to get it out of the, the, the oil well and, you know, get it into our tank. And certainly this figure published in the US that is about 84% efficient or we lose about 16% efficiency getting the fuel out of the ground and into our tank. The engine itself, I show my four cylinders here, is about, can be about 40% efficient. It's about 40% efficient peak for a diesel engine. And it's probably in the mid thirties for a petrol engine. But we rarely operate at these high efficiency points. And on average, when we're driving our vehicle, a reasonable number for diesel would be, we might be 20% efficient. And for gasoline, we might be 17% efficient. And so when I multiply my well to tank by my well to, by my tank to wheel, I get my well to wheel efficiency over on the right. And our diesel is about 17% efficient. Our gasoline is about 14% efficient. So for gasoline, what that's telling us, when I propel that one ton vehicle down the road, six parts in every seven just go to heat and are lost to the environment. Only one part in seven is going to useful mechanical, um, you know, physical motion of the vehicle. As we do that, we learn a bit of chemistry. And what we see at the bottom of the diagram is the formula for the combustion of isooctane, which is a, a, a form of, of gasoline. And we get the C8H18, we react it with the oxygen. And on the other side of the equation, we're going to get carbon dioxide and water. Now, we're not that bothered about the water, but we can see that each molecule of isooctane results in eight molecules of CO2. They actually, and I think we'll just about to put numbers on that. Each liter of gasoline combusted releases about 2.4 kilograms of CO2. Each U.S. gasoline, each, each U.S. gallon combusted releases about 20 pounds of CO2. And the final number typically for me comes from the National Geographic. Humanity releases close to 40 trillion kilograms of CO2 into the atmosphere every year now. And the transportation contributes a significant amount to that. So because, because of these, we talk about global warming, we talk about climate change. There are other factors as well, where, and we're just about to get into one, but I will say that when I started work on electric vehicles in 1990, the motivating factor, and the reason I was in Los Angeles was because of the smog in Los Angeles. And the long view taken at General Motors that cars would need to become cleaner as cities expanded and, and at higher power densities or in our population densities. So that's what was driving us in 1990. In 1990, in the early 1990s, what next drove it was the first Gulf War and the idea that oil supplies were unstable. Now, this concept has been explored many times through history whether it's back in the 70s, whether it's back in various wars. But that's kind of what drove in the mid 90s. And then it became a factor again after 9-11, 2001, uh, this kind of love-hate relationship with fossil fuels and the, the economics and the security of that supply. So that's the third item. But what has become a very popular um, argument in recent times has been global warming and climate change. But the next slide, I think, takes us into the territory which has been uh, defining the situation more in recent years. It's not just CO2 and water is emitted from the exhaust. We have carbon monoxide in gas from gasoline engines. We have particulate matter coming from diesel engines. We got nitrous oxide and methane coming from various engines. We got NOx, nitrogen oxide and nitrogen dioxide, volatile organic compounds and total hydrocarbons. 
these last ones were, I think, what caused a significant impact because, and, and the, the date stands out for me, it was the 18th of September 2015 when the Volkswagen scandal kind of broke onto the market and the implications of that were very significant. It was to tell the largely urbanized populations in, say, in Europe and around the world that the diesel engine, which Europe had betted so much on, was not going to give them clean, breathable air. <clears throat> and that kind of burst the bubble, and I think it's had a huge impact. Yes, we have security supply issues. Yes, we have uh, climate issues. Uh, but, but breathing toxic air in urban environments has become a significant factor. This is a, a relatively old chart, uh, but we can see the trends uh, where these are the grams of CO2 emissions per kilometer. And we can see that all around the world, they're trending down. And we know they're only getting lower. Uh, we see that on the right hand axis is liters per 100 kilometers. So they're kind of similar factors once you start crunching the, 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 uh, the basic chemistry. So that's what's happening globally. Everybody is trying to get more efficient. Heavy duty vehicles have also been, um, uh, are getting impacted because of course, a lot of our buses or urban transportation or heavy duty or 18 wheelers are based on diesel fuel. And like we learned from, from the Volkswagen scandal, our diesel fuel emissions are quite toxic in urban environments. So there's been significant um, constraints come in on particulate matter and NOx. Now, just to know for heavy duty vehicles, the emissions controls tend to be based not so much on the vehicle, but on the, 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 the power of the vehicle itself, the kilowatts available from the engine, if I uh, have that correct. So we can see here we're generally applying Euro 6 now. Uh, so we're significantly down on where we were a number of years ago. We are addressing a number of these. Actually, I'd say we're addressing all these with electric vehicles, but I'll put a caveat on that. There are four basic type of electric vehicles as I see it. There is the battery electric vehicle. There's the hybrid electric vehicle. There's the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. And there's a fuel cell electric vehicle. And I say all these are electric vehicles because they have an electric powertrain that can independently propel the vehicle for a portion of the journey. A mild hybrid, is a more conventional vehicle, but it takes advantage of electrification such that electric stop start, regenerative braking, and improved fuel economy can work the way into the conventional vehicle. So I think looking forward, it's, it's reasonable to expect that all conventional vehicles will have more electric electrification and will become mild hybrids. And then we'll have all the, the other four classes of vehicles competing uh, with different success stories, depending on the, on the markets and economies and, and the applications. <clears throat> the advantages and challenges for EVs, just, this is just a quick slide. What, we were talking earlier about efficiency. We're going to be seeing that the efficiency of electric vehicles is very high. A challenge for internal combustion vehicles are vehicle idling losses. That is something we can really reduce with electric vehicle. Having that battery on board for hybrid, electric or plug-in hybrid, or even a mild hybrid, means we can start to recover braking energy and not be dumping good kinetic energy into heat in the brakes. A big selling point for electric vehicles that I'm, I'm kind of not that sold on is we get wonderful high torque from our machines. We can do zero to 60 miles per hour in two seconds now in our latest Tesla. It's wonderful, you know, it's, it's, it's nice, but it's, it's not real in its own way, but um, it, it certainly is a selling point. And of course, what has made this all work has been lithium ion batteries, which we'll come back to in a while. On the flip side, we do have challenges. Cost of our fuel cells of batteries, well, the cost of batteries has been coming down. Range, has becoming less of an issue as the cost and the weight of the batteries have been dropping. Manufacturing is, uh, has been improving uh, to the carbon intensity of manufacturing, the pollutants, all these things are challenges. 
the sourcing of components, so concerns about cobalt and lithium. Can we recycle the batteries? A great advantage of a lead acid battery is, is it was, I think, 95% recyclable. We're struggling with recycling right now in lithium ion batteries. And of course, we need an infrastructure. But we need quite a wide infrastructure. We need an educational infrastructure. You know, we need people taking courses, students learning about this. We're going to need technicians trained in it. Uh, we, and it's not just a physical infra infrastructure of charging and stuff like that. It's a, a massive sea change required in the automotive and societal worlds for the EV to be successful. A, a challenge which I used to note a bit more a few years back, but I, I'm not sure that it's as big an issue anymore, is the heating, ventilation and air conditioning. That can reduce the rain significantly, depending on the climate. You're in Brazil, it can be quite hot and humid. Uh, at certain times of year, and you need the air conditioning uh, working, and that can be quite a hog on the battery. Uh, heat pumps are, are playing a greater part, uh, and there's a shift away from, from the traditional ceramic heaters that uh, Tesla were using up until, I think, this year, and they're now shifting to heat pumps as well. So there are improvements and changes coming on the heating and ventilation and air conditioning fronts. <clears throat> Go back to uh, 1996, seems like a long time ago, it is a long time ago. It's 25 years ago this year that General Motors launched the GM EV1. The car was leased in uh, Southern California and Arizona. Uh, by 1996, I'd been there six years. At that point, I was working on the inductive charging, but less about me, more about the car. Beautiful two-seater car. A bit like maybe the Tesla Roadster, <clears throat> which is really a, a, a sibling of it in its own way. The battery pack was a lead acid pack, which was shaped as a T and ran from the front of the car down through the between the driver and passenger and teed at the back of the two seats. The, that was 1996, 17 kilowatt hour battery. In 1999, we had a second generation with a nickel metal hydride battery, which I remember correctly is 29 kilowatt hours. We use inductive charging. I could spend hours telling you about that, but I won't. Uh, which plugged in our inductive coupler into the front of the car in, at the fascia. It had an induction machine. Uh, for propulsion, a 100 kilowatt machine, IGBT inverters, these would have been the first IGBTs on, on the vehicle at the time, even though they had been uh, developed for high speed rail in Japan in the 80s. Because the battery was so heavy, we had to do whatever we could to improve the range. We had to lighten the weight. We had to use an aluminum uh, body. We would have done what we could to lower the drag of the vehicle. So it was quite a forward-looking and advanced uh, vehicle at the time. The challenge, of course, was the battery. Everything else was superb. <clears throat> so speaking of batteries and going back to Thomas Edison, in 1883, Thomas was telling us, 1883, a storage battery is, in my opinion, a catchpenny, a sensation, a mechanism for swindling the public by stock companies. Just as soon as a man gets working on the secondary battery, it brings out his latent capacity for lying. Scientifically, storage is all right, but commercially as absolute a failure as one can imagine. He did a lot of work on nickel batteries and was relatively successful there. But the reality is, is over 100 years later, we were still dependent on the lead acid battery when we brought the GM EV1 to market. So little change in our, techno, in our technical world. What was the change? Well, we'll now go to the, uh, the Royal Swedish Academy and we'll note that in 2019, about a year and a half ago, in November, they gave the Nobel Prize in Chemistry to three electrochemists. John Goodenough, based at the University of Texas in Austin, Stanley Whittingham at Binghamton University in uh, New York, and Akira Yoshino at uh, Maijo University in Nagoya for the development of lithium-ion batteries. 
So what is that battery? Small bit of electrochemistry again. Let's start in the top left here with Whittingham's battery. That battery had the, the brighter color here electrode is was a lithium uh, anode. The kind of um, striped shade was a cathode and that was titanium disulfide. And the voltage from that cell was two volts. Now to the relatively unstable cell, not that suitable for, for applications. John Goodenough, around 1979, 1980, uh, replaced the, the cathode with a cobalt oxide um, technology. And that had a significant impact. It raised the voltage up to four volts. So now we were up to a very good functional level. If you, if you remember, lead acid voltage is about 2.2 volts for a cell. Our NICADs are about 1.2 volts, as is our nickel metal hydride. So four volts was a great step forward. The next big improvement came from uh, Akiro Yoshino, and he would have replaced the lithium electrode or uh, anode with, with graphite or petroleum coke. And this final battery is really what we have today. We have a graphite electrode and we have a cobalt oxide um, cathode and we have a barrier. Now we, we, we have problems with these batteries. They still go on fire. They, they still age. Uh, there's a whole bunch of challenges with them, but it has been a pretty phenomenal battery. And we'll, we'll see the, the, the scale in, in terms of, of size that are brought in. But these are our three characters uh, winning the 2019 Nobel Prize. <clears throat> with that battery, we have to give credit to Tesla for pushing this a long distance. The Tesla Roadster came out in 2008. Then we had the Model S, the Model X, the Model 3, the Model Y, the Cybertruck. They were helped by credits and subsidies. They really worked on the luxury product and branding. And something that had fundamentally changed as well is this environmental and social statement became quite popular. If I go back to 1999, when we were struggling to sell uh, electric vehicles at General Motors with our new battery pack, the price of one gallon of gasoline in Los Angeles was about $1. It was very difficult to argue for green technologies. The public wasn't engaged and the government didn't really care. We had cheap fuel. That was the end of chapter one. Chapter two, we're going to go on to, it's called vehicle dynamics. It's, uh, it's trying to understand the car from a couple of perspectives. I would like to know what we want our car to do. How fast do we want it to drive? How do we model the car? But really what I'd like to know is how do I size my battery to get a range? And how do I determine the torque and speed that I require for my electric motor? So that's what we're looking at for from this chapter. There are three sections. There's road load forces, which we're about to discuss. There's vehicle acceleration, and there's a simple drawing cycle, which I'll uh, rapidly run through these three concepts because they're quite interesting. When I was starting looking at cars a long time ago, we typically talk about the drag coefficient we talk about the rolling resistance and the climbing resistance. Now we typically talk about these terms certainly for heavy duty vehicles, but for light duty vehicles, what's really wonderful is for every production vehicle into the United States for the last couple of decades, vehicles have to supply, manufacturers supply what we call the co-stone parameters. So they speed the vehicle up to 80 kilometers per hour and let the vehicle slow down and it characterize it there as a quadratic. And so what they're showing in that quadratic is the relationship between the road load force and speed. And it comes out as basically a, a combination of drag, which is this V squared, a rolling resistance, which is the A phenomenon, and B, which is a spinning loss. And for every vehicle and like in, on, on the EPA website, we get these ABCs, typically in American or Imperial units, and it's easy to convert these to, to metric units, as I show on the bottom table. 
So with that, we can describe every vehicle, whether it's the Model 3 or the Nissan Leaf or the latest, you know, Volvo EV. And here we see some, some vehicles. Uh, I haven't updated this in a while. Uh, this is what's in the book. This just vehicle parameters. I do show on the left-hand column, the General Motors EV1, just a note there, came out in 1996. It's a battery electric vehicle. It's got a drag coefficient of 0 0.19, which was phenomenally low even today. A weight, just sitting on the, on, on the road, of 1,400 kilograms. A rated power of 100 kilowatts. A rated torque of 150, uh, 150 newton meters. The max speed of the car was 80 miles per hour, and the, which is about 129 kilometers per hour, we could do zero to 60 in eight and a half seconds. There's a gear ratio there of about 10.9, a wheel radius of about, about 0.3 of a meter is, is appropriate for most of these vehicles. We see the factors in for the Nissan Leaf, the Tesla Model S, the Toyota Prius, the Lexus RX 450H, the Chevy Volt, the Toyota Mirai, and we could easily update this very rapidly for new vehicles that are just coming on the market this year. Knowing the road load uh, coefficients, ABCs, I can very simply then determine the power required at the drive axle to move the vehicle at a particular speed. So we see here on the x-axis, speed in kilometers per hour, and in the y-axis, the road load power. And we're seeing here, if I go the, the, the Lowest powers required to travel at a particular speed are for the Chevy Volt, the Toyota Prius, the Tesla Model S. Uh, the Tesla Model S power gets high because it's going at a very high speed. I think we're up to 224 kilometers per hour. The Nissan Leaf isn't as probably, the drag isn't as good and it's probably a slightly heavy vehicle. Uh, so it's a higher road load force. And the Lexus RX 450H, which of course is a heavy SUV, it's very boxy, it's going to have a poor drag coefficient uh, and, and weight, and that tends to have the highest road load power. So this would be true, you know, this kind of SUVs are heavier, worse drag, uh, we, we're looking for aerodynamic and stuff like that. So nice thing right here for power engineers, we know the power required at the drive axle. With some simple assumptions then, I think for this one, we're saying if I have a 90 kilowatt hour battery, and my power train is on average 85 or 90% efficient, we can then calculate the range because we know the power required. It's a very simple calculation. And we can see here that whew, at about 70 kilometers per hour, we could be up to 800 kilometers range. And at uh, 140 kilometers per hour, could be down to about 350. If you compare this to the actual numbers published by Tesla, this simple 30 second calculation probably comes within about 10%. So it's, it's a very powerful tool having the ABCs. So that was the, the road load force. Notice discuss uh, acceleration. We are going to propel the vehicle through a, a transmission which comes with a some gear ratio. Now transmissions are tending to be quite efficient. I'm not a mechanical expert. I happily haven't become one. Uh, but we're looking at efficiencies about 95, 96, 97% efficient, which is pretty impressive. It's, it's numbers that power engineers like. So what we're showing here is we have a traction motor. In our case, it's an electric motor and with torque from the rotor. We have torque required at the axle and a speed required at the, at the drive axle. And there's going to be a power flow from the motor to the transmission down to the drive axle when we're motoring. And we can now very simply determine the torque required uh, as the output from the motor or engine. And it's a function of various vehicle parameters, the acceleration required, the VDT, and the ABCs. And finally, we have the MG, the times the sine of theta, which is the climbing force required. So going to the chart in the top right, we see that if we're driving on the flat, we're at zero degrees and we require about 40 kilowatts for the Nissan LEAF at about 150 kilometers per hour. However, if we're on a six degree slope, 
which is a common slope used uh, for analysis in the automotive world. Uh, at 120 kilometers, we hit about 80 kilowatts. And 80 kilowatts was the rated power for the 2011 Nissan Leaf. So we could see that we could do 120 kilometers per hour, about 75 miles per hour on a six degree slope. But we also see then on a minus six degree slope, the wonder of the electric vehicle. We get negative power. And this we can use, there are, our transmission is bidirectional, our electric motor is bidirectional. We can slow down the car and recover this energy by running it to the battery and simply putting it back in the battery. And this is a fantastic step. So we can get that in either recovery going down or if we hit the brakes, we can use our electric train to take the vehicle. Where we're doing is taking kinetic energy from the wheels, routing it through the transmission and powertrain and back into the battery. And that's the wonderful advantage of our electric powertrain. And again, it's the same equations that work. We just have a negative torque instead of a positive torque. And for speed, it's negative if it were in reverse. <clears throat> so on the EPA website, there's a whole bunch of vehicles. So I, I, I did this to 2021, 2021 cars. This update came out, I think, in November, December. They come out before the year on the EPA. There'll probably be an update in July. And I just note here. So we go always back. The first relevant car is the Nissan Leaf in 2011. Can come all the way through these bunch of cars to the Pulsar 2 in 2021. Uh, the Volvo XC40 P8 in 2021, and then we can work our way down. Uh, there, there, there's updates to these. Tesla doesn't necessarily update every year, but it does update, or when it launches a new model, you'll find the date in there. I use this as a project for my students. I, uh, if I have 40 students in a class, I give them each their own vehicle. I ask them research the vehicle, go on to the EPA website, find the ABCs, Find out separately what you can about the gear ratios, the torque, the the uh, the power available from the vehicle. Tell us what you can about it, and model it. Determine the road load forces, and model the acceleration. That earlier equation that we just had will get you the acceleration of the vehicle. We just do a, a time step modeling of the DVDT, and indeed we'll see. I think we have it on the next slide. This is a, a very simple time step model at the top for the Nissan Leaf, I think to 2015. Uh, we do a full pedal to the metal acceleration, uh, so which means it's full torque. We hit the rate of speed, the torque drops off, but we're at full power. And when we do that, our prediction from a model using the ABCs and some other analysis, our basic assumptions and, and research, we were modeling it, I think, as getting to 60 miles per hour in about, um, just looking here, I think we were predicting about 10.9 seconds, and the actual, I think, was 11 and a half. So a, a wonderful, very simple calculation. You can do it in Excel, you can do it in MATLAB, you can do it with any, any little program. You can do it by hand, actually. So I, I do discuss this uh, in the book and in the chapter. And it, it later in the chapter, in chapter 15, we then apply control. I'm not going to talk much about it, but we take the vehicle acceleration and we close the speed loop. We model our brain. We're, we're relatively slow. We got a crossover frequency of maybe about five hertz and a relatively low bandwidth, but we can, we can see the speedometer and we can press the accelerator. The accelerator then feeds into a torque slash current command in the modern vehicle and we're commanding torque. And so we, in chapter 15, we generate, we create a symlink model of the vehicle uh, in, in a small signal. We put it into a large signal model. We determine the P, the proportional and integral coefficients to stabilize it. And we do a full throttle acceleration and we compare it to our simple spreadsheet. So it's, it's a lovely example of control and how to apply it in the power world. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it a little bit more in, in the next one as well, because once you're into controlling power and torque, speed and torque, you can talk about controlling voltage and current, which of course is what we need as well. 
The other uh, uh, task or the other section here, the final section, is we define a simple drive cycle. Now, this drive cycle is very simple. We are going to drive for, we're going to be in the car for one hour. The first 30 minutes, we're going to drive at 50 kilometers per hour. The ne next 20 minutes, we will drive for 90 kilometers per hour, and then we idle for 10 minutes. And these, strangely enough, it's very simple, is kind of reflective of what the new European drive cycle was. So I just give my very simplest version of it. And what we're going to do now as we go through next our battery electric vehicle, then our fuel cell electric vehicle, and then our hybrid electric vehicle, we're going to calculate for a particular vehicle that we're going to standardize on what the fuel consumption is for this drive cycle. And then we can calculate carbon emissions and anything else we'd like to know. So we'll, we'll briefly touch on that. So that's our drive cycle. And that takes us into part three, which is batteries. So here we were going into electrochemistry, but I go into electrochemistry from the perspective of what do I need to know as an electrical engineer? What do I need to know from an automotive perspective? <clears throat> and uh, so I would have had a lot of discussions with, with um, some of the, the, the large battery companies, which we know of. Uh, LG Chem would be an example. And so that's, this is the outcome from that. And there's, some, uh, there's a lovely seminar or PowerPoint on the slides as well from a, uh, a Wisconsin uh, professor at the time actually working with Ford on batteries as well, Oliver Gross. Uh, so all of this material is actually quite useful at the time. In me, coming to batteries and saying, how do I look at them as a automotive or electrical engineer? So we're going to do our basic definitions. We're going to be able to size a battery pack. We're going to convert the vehicle requirements into pack voltage and current and relate that to fuel economy and range. <clears throat> <clears throat> a little on our batteries. I'm just going to look at the two extremes here. 1996, the very top, the, the General Motors EV1 comes out. The vehicle weighs 1,400 kilos. The battery weighs 500 kilos was made by Delphi in Indiana, lead acid technology, 17 kilowatt hours of battery, specific energy, watt hours per kilogram of 34, nominal voltage, about two volts per cell, uh, nominally, of about 312 volts for the pack. Rated power, 100 kilowatts, specific power, watts per kilogram of 200. I'll skip the, the P to E, that's the power to energy. Um, so that's where we were. Now let's look at where we're closer to today. The, the very bottom, the 2019 Tesla Model 3. I think the vehicle weighs about 1850 kilograms. The battery weighs about 477 kilograms. It's very close to the weight of the battery in the GM EV1. It's made by Panasonic in Japan and in the gigafactories around the world, lithium ion. The rated energy is 80 kilowatt hours which is, well, let's go to specific energy, it's 168. And just to get this correct, 168 divided by 34, that's five times effectively higher specific energy in, in watt hours per kilogram for the latest lithium ion battery compared to lead acid in the mid nineties. And that has been the making and the revolution in this technology. Unusually for, for Tesla, they've gone with a, a massive number of, I think, D-sized cells. A D-cell might be the size of my thumb. There's, on this particular model of the Model 3, there's 4,416 cells. Not too long ago, there were 7,104 cells uh, of the, I think, 18650s in the Tesla Model S. But we see the big change here, a five-fold improvement in specific energy for lithium ion compared to lead acid. One has been maturing for 30 years, the other had been maturing for 100 years and longer. We know from our phones, our laptops, cars, that batteries degrade. So this is one of the things I was teasing through as I was having my battery discussions. 
And it seemed at the time, so, so what we're seeing here now is, and the bottom on the x-axis is the depth of discharge go from a here zero to 100% depth of discharge. On the left are the number of charge discharge cycles going from zero to 10,000. The typical number you can start with is the very bottom over here to the right, that if I discharge my pack 100%, I can typically uh, do that about a thousand times in a lithium ion battery before I hit end of life. And that might be a degradation in storage of 20 to 30% and maybe an, an increase in the resistance of maybe 50%. So the very, the left hand curve is L is equal to one. This is a, a lifetime index that I, I kind of made up, but it, it works quite well. And saying that originally for, to size a lithium ion battery, that the life of the battery was related to the energy tr throughput. So as we see here, if I was to discharge it 100%, I could get a thousand cycles out of it. But if I discharge it only 50%, I would get 2000 cycles out of it. And that I think I can fairly say is where we were 10 years ago. Where we are in more recent times is closer to or L equal to three or lifetime index of three, where yes, we can still get a thousand cycles out of our battery, 100% discharge. But if I go to 50%, I can get 8,000 discharges. So a very high number. In fact, the number is higher now. This is my, or the best number I had three or four years ago. And we can start to see here, battery technology has matured. We know more about the batteries. We've extended the life of the batteries such that now we can guarantee either a nature warranty, a 12 year warranty. Toyota on their latest battery packs in Ireland guarantee 15 years on the hybrid battery. And we're seeing eight to 10 years is starting to be common for, for regular batteries. That's a pretty phenomenal change. We couldn't get that from a lithium ion battery. Simple, lots of examples and problems in the car. This is, this is an interesting one, or just, I'll just read it very quickly. Determining the beginning of life, kilowatt hour storage required in a battery electric vehicle battery pack based on the following requirements. Eight years of operation, an average of 48 kilometers of driving per day, over 365 days of the year, daily charging, and an average battery energy output per kilometer of 180 watt hours per kilometer. Assume a lifetime index of one, and that we can do 1,000 uh, charge discharge cycles with, at 100%. Assume two parallel battery strings, which 96 lithium ion cells per string, with a total number of cells of 192, and a nominal voltage per cell, of 3.75 volts. Determine the amp hours per cell and what are the vehicle ranges at beginning of life and end of life. Very simple example that describes the 2011 Nissan Leaf. The answer to that is about 20 something kilowatt hours, which is where we started. 48 kilometers per day, that is where, that is the, the, the average driving uh, in much of the world. So I think the average daily drive in the US is about 50 kilometers per day. And so 50 kilometers per day, 365 days a year, eight years of operation to meet, to meet our guarantees, we can size our battery pack. And then we can go to an improved battery and we get the, we get the, um, we get the extended lifetime. So then we get into battery chemistry and stuff a little bit more. And just to know there are three real areas of operation. It's also the same for the fuel cell. We talk about ohmic, we talk about activization polarization, we talk about concentration polarization. In electrochemistry, the, the names uh, Nernst pops up, Gibbs pop up. It's, it's great to know of these characters. And so then we, we kind of work with what they were telling us. What Gibbs was telling us is that a voltage was outcome from an electrochemical reaction. What Nernst was telling us was that the voltage would drop as the as as energy was extracted, and we know all these things today. So very simply, then I I define a voltage uh, model at the bottom of the diagram. In if you're interested uh, on battery modeling, we did publish a paper at IEEE ECCE this past year 
that really we look at the the modeling or the, the, the data from the US national labs and we looked at the various models that were available and we, we put our best data in there. So it's a very good paper if you want to know more about battery modeling. We know that we can discharge a battery. When, do we, when we charge a battery, the voltage on the cell is gonna increase because the current direction has changed. And what we try not to do with batteries generally is go above 4.3 volts because that'll affect the lifetime, the higher voltage. And we see here, so we have a lower discharge rate, or sorry, a lower charge rate to C over three. If the capacity rate is low and we stay below the 4.3 volts, we can keep charging the battery. When we go to high power charging, we're going to be going with a high C rate, say for instance here, the four C rate, and we're going to hit this low, the, the 4.3 volt limit at a lower depth of discharge or a higher state of charge, which means we're going to have to cut back a fall back in charging. And of course, we know that we can only do high power charging for so long for a number of reasons. We're going to overheat the pack due to the power loss within the pack, and we're going to damage the life of the battery if we put too high a voltage across the cells. And that comes out again from the simple application of, of our electrochemical equations. Finally, in the battery, we'd like to know what the range is. Well, not really. I'd like to know in this one for our earlier drive cycle, which looking at our table on the left, 50 kilometers per hour, 90 kilometers per hour and idle. We make some assumptions here just to keep life simple that the battery, the powertrain itself is about 85% efficient to the transmission. The gearing efficiency is about 95%. So we, these are reasonable numbers. The charger efficiency is about 85%. Uh, and then we're coming in from the grid. And with this, we know the time, we can calculate the battery energy. We can calculate the energy coming from the grid. We have the nominal efficiency of the powertrain. We can then calculate the watt hours per kilometer the miles per gallon equivalent, the range of the vehicle, and the CO2 emissions based on the, the emissions per kilowatt hour in whatever country. I take the examples of the US and Norway. In Norway, it's 90 something percent hydro, very little emissions. In the US, fair bit of gas, coal, uh, so uh, higher emissions. And we can see here, of course, partially why Norway has embraced electric vehicles so much because they're their energy costs are so low and they have such an abundance of hydro available. So that's the table we need for comparisons. We brought out the book, I finished the editing in October 2017. Uh, Elon Musk stepped in and introduced his 80,000 pound truck in November 2017. There's a lovely 10 minute video that's referenced here on the Charge TV website, or you can find it online. But lovely in that, Elon Musk gave us a whole bunch of information. So usually if I have time, we watch this, it's 10 minutes, but we're not gonna do it. But let's tell you what we learned from Elon. Elon told us that the truck was gonna be 80,000 pounds. The range of the vehicle was gonna be 500 miles at an average speed of 60 miles per hour. The drag coefficient for this vehicle was gonna be very low, 0.36, very, very low for a heavy duty vehicle. An acceleration from zero to 60 in five seconds and uh, in 20 seconds for a full 80,000 pound load. It can do 65 miles per hour, fully loaded up to 5% grade. We can recharge the battery to 400 miles of range in 30 minutes. There are four motors, one each of the rear wheels. Each motor is roughly a, a Tesla Model S induction machine. And there's a battery life of a thousand miles. So we make some just a couple of additional assumptions. We know the drag, we're just gonna assume what the frontal area is. We're gonna make an assumption, we're gonna be make a generous assumption about the rolling resistance to get that load because rolling resistance is quite dominant for a heavy vehicle. And then we'll, we'll, we'll put in a reasonable number for the auxiliary load about two kilowatts. And with that, we can calculate the mass of battery in the vehicle. Sorry, I'm looking for my book to, um, I think the mass of that battery, I'll have to look, it's, it might be about 10 metric tons or something on that scale. Uh, and we can check it later on. It's a lovely example and it's really, um, it's a fun video from Elon and it's real engineering and the application of automotive and battery technology.
That takes us to fuel cells. We discuss fuel cells, basic operation, the sizing of the fuel cell plant, fuel cell aging, the, and then we size the fuel cell again for the heavy duty truck from Elon Musk that we just sized the battery for. And we go through the fuel economy for, for our drive cycle again. These are fuel cell vehicles, uh, courtesy of my good friend Abbas in Los Angeles. On the top left is a hotel transport. We see a full uh, cruising bus uh, uh, next to that. We have the, the cab for an 18-wheeler coming out of Long Beach uh, Port on the bottom left. And we have a street sweeper in the bottom right. Phenomenal vehicles, all fuel cells, all with relatively long range and fully electric power trains. What does Abbas tell folks about why they need to adopt fuel cell technology? Number of uh, points here. Number one, they're fast fueling. And because of that fast fueling, the downtime on your commercial vehicle is quite low and you can plan on 24 seven operation. You get high range and it's the only vehicle that's really heavy duty and zero emissions that can go into urban environments. So those are the selling points uh, leaving the vehicles. General, what we're seeing, we're seeing battery electric vehicles for light duty vehicles, and we're seeing batteries also come into the heavy duty vehicles, but there, there will be competition from fuel cells and, and, and hybrids. A little bit of chemistry again, at the very top, we talked about Gibbs, there's our Gibbs equation relating energy to voltage. Uh, next down, we have the Nernst equation, we're relating voltage to the energy extracted from the cell. Interestingly, in our fuel cell, it's really a reaction of uh, oxygen and hydrogen, and the voltage is quite low. The nominal voltage, I think, is about 1 to 1.2 volts. The actual voltage we get is about 0.9 something volts out of the cell, as we'll just see in a moment. In fact, here we see it here. In our chart here, we see a polarization curve for a cell. Cell voltage is on the left vertical axis, where specific current is on the x-axis. And we're seeing that when we pull zero current, we're at a, the no load voltage. I think it's about 0.93 for this type of PIM fuel cell. And then as we pull current from the cell, the voltage drops. The power we're extracting from the cell increases until we hit a peak power roughly at about 0.6 volts in the cell. And then beyond that point, the, the power drops off uh, quite rapidly until, until we, we hit a short circuit condition. So we try to operate between no load and the maximum power on our fuel cell. Actually, we, we don't like to operate at no load because of the cell inefficiencies. We tend to operate at light load. That might be five or 10% of the, of, of the maximum uh, power from the cell. In doing the fuel cell uh, drive cycle, uh, we build the well to tank. So taking our, our hydrogen from a steam reforming process from methane, and that's about 60% efficient. The fuel cell on board itself is about 58% efficient. I model the overall powertrain loss at about 70% efficiency, with about 2% of that going into boost converter. And then the, so the overall well to wheel for a fuel cell vehicle is about 27%, say going from methane to, 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 the, to the drive axle. If we get our hydrogen from electrolysis, then that has a different impact and is viewed differently. I think what is driving uh, fuel cell vehicles quite a bit right now is the use of hydrogen from uh, bio sources such as um, waste products and stuff like that. That is having a significant impact. That takes us to hybridization. What I was looking to do here was understand what really was our internal combustion engine doing? And how do I explain that as an electrical engineer? And then how do I play and understand that its role in a hybrid vehicle? Fortunately, Abbas had done a, has done a lot of work in this space. So I was really able to tap into to his expertise there. So here we're just gonna briefly note the advantages of the hybrid electric vehicle. 
we're going to discuss something crucial, the brake specific fuel consumption, which makes the engine understandable to us electrical engineers or mechanical engineers or whoever, without having to get into our four cycles, the Carnot cycle and the auto cycle and stuff like that. We have uh, comparative vehicles for the drive cycles of a conventional vehicle, a series hybrid and a series uh, parallel uh, for, uh, hybrid. And then we look at the end at the, the CVT, the continuously variable transmission that is the piece of magic behind the Toyota Prius. And we see at the bottom here, just a figure of our vehicle. We have our tank providing fuel onto the vehicle our internal combustion engine, an Atkinson cycle engine, looking at a peak efficiency in the mid to high 30s. Our CVT is our continuously variable transmission, which now has a generator motor, electric motor. All looks complicated, but it's actually quite simple in the grand scheme of things. Uh, feeding energy back to the, the battery. Uh, overall, we'd be looking at a well to wheel with gasoline of about 24% which is a, you know, 10 percentage points above the 14% we're getting with a conventional gasoline vehicle. The advantage of the hybrid vehicle is one, the elimination of vehicle idling losses, two, the use of energy recovery for regenerative braking. Three, we can optimize the energy management. We have a battery and we have an engine. Let's get the two of them fine tuned together. And that allows us to run the engine more efficiently and reduce emissions and may result in the downsizing of the engine, but interestingly, may require an upsizing of the engine. I'd note there that in two, the first Prius that came out was a 1.4 liter Prius. And to my knowledge, in 2004, Toyota went to the, the boost converter and the 1.8 liter Prius in order to run the engine in its sweet spot and get an improved fuel economy from the vehicle. We get significant low speed torque, good accelerations, and we can manage the lifetime and the batteries. Thus, Toyota can offer me a Prius with a 15 year uh, warranty in Ireland. Now, we, warranties and batteries is dependent on, on temperatures. We're relatively cold here, uh, but not too cold. This chart here, we're looking at engine speed on the X axis. And in the chart to the left, we're looking at torque on the Y axis. The, the humpy one is diesel. We get a very high peaking, low speed torque from diesel. Just below that, we have gasoline, which tends to be a kind of flatter torque curve to it. Below that, we get the Atkinson cycle engine, which has a relatively narrower speed, uh, flatter torque curve. And then of course, the kind of quasi linear thing here is the electric vehicle motor, which we get a high torque at low speed and it drops off beyond the, beyond the, the rate of speed. Uh, and we can see, so this high torque and low speed gives us that excellent acceleration at, uh, at standstill. We see the powertrain efficiency in the right. Uh, in the 80s, we have the battery electric vehicle. Between 50 and 60%, we'd have the fuel cell electric vehicle. Kissing 40%, we have the diesel electric vehicle. In the kind of mid to high 30s, we have the Atkinson cycle gasoline engine. And in the kind of low to mid thirties, we have the, the uh, regular conventional gasoline engine. So we can see the electric powertrain brings efficiency and low speed torque are quite obvious advantages. So now our engine, what did I need to understand about the engine? And I love this diagram here. It's a brake specific fuel consumption map for a General Motors engine, it's a Saturn 1.9 liter uh, gasoline engine uh, from the 90s. But interestingly, engines haven't improved that much in the last 20 plus years. There's been marginal improvements, but those marginal improvements in fuel in engine efficiency have been kind of lost in the other end by the increased requirements for emissions control. I mean, effectively on some vehicles now we have a mini flamethrower um, that, that's burning the emissions coming from our diesel uh, vehicles. So energy is consumed there as well. We, we're looking at, in this particular vehicle, we're looking at a peak efficiency of, well, it's showing 33.8%. So it's probably 34, 35% in the very middle of that contour, uh, but it's showing 250 grams per kilowatt hour. 
we can translate that into power for a particular uh, speed. But we talked about our drive cycle. Point one here at the kind of just at about 2000 RPM is our 50 kilometers per hour. A point one where it's 16.9% efficient roughly according to this curve on the engine. At point two when we're at 90 kilometers per hour, we're about 24.1% efficient. When we're idling, well, we're 0% we're efficient. We're just sucking in gasoline and we're pulling in about 600 grams per kilowatt hour into the engine um, during that idling condition. Or sorry, well, actually, that's not true. There, there is no output. We're just spinning our wheels. So we can see here, even though relatively high efficiencies are possible in our vehicle, for the gasoline engine into the mid-30s, for diesel close to 40, we're not operating there in much of our driving. And certainly in our urban driving, we're not operating, operating there at all. We're down into the teens and the, the 20s and, and lower in terms of efficiencies. So we, we do our drive to site like in here. I have a, a vehicle we still have. It's a General Motors vehicle. It's an Opel Zafira, which was a family minivan. And we see here the gear ratio is going from gear one to gear five and the reverse gearing and the differential and the speeds recommended in the General Motors manual for operation. And so we use these to, to translate our speed uh, to our engine output and to figure out what our torque and speed is going to be in the engine. And with that, we can generate the fuel consumption and the carbon emissions on the vehicle. And very quickly here, uh, I won't spend much time on this, for our vehicles, we're assuming 40 litres for the SI, the spark ignition or gasoline engine, 40 litre tank as well for the compressed ignition or diesel engine, 60 kilowatt hours for the battery electric vehicle, 40 litre tank for the two hybrids and five kilograms of fuel for the fuel cell vehicle, just like they have in the Toyota Mirai. Uh, so we're, we're typically, interestingly, we are typically now up to about a 60 kilowatt hour battery and more is what we're looking at for our, our typical electric vehicles that are certainly coming onto the markets in Europe and the US. We can contrast and compare the efficiency of the powertrain, the fuel consumption in watt hours per kilometer, in liters per kilowatt hour, in miles per gallon equivalent for electric, in carbon emissions per kilometer, and in range of the vehicle. We have the Longest range with the series parallel hybrid at uh, 1,108 kilometers and the shortest range with the 60 kilowatt hour BEV at 485 kilometers. So that's uh, the end of that kind of energy section. And just to touch for hybridization on our continuously variable transmission, it's a lovely piece of technology. Here we see a photo of it of the Toyota Prius from 2004 from the Oak Ridge uh, um, reports. And very simply, it's a sun and planetary gear system. I'm a power guy. It's nice to talk about the speed relationships between engine, motor, and generator within the CVT and relating that via the differential down to the, the drive axle speed. And then for power, well, there's four real powers happening. There's the engine power, there's the motor power, there's the generator power, and the resultant of all that will be available for the vehicle to use as traction power. That traction power could be coming back to me as region, in which case I'll run it to uh, recharge the battery back in as generator power. So it's a lovely, um, it's a lovely technology and quite easily understandable. So that's our sun and planetary gear set. We do these various examples, and this is a, a simple one here of our series uh, parallel hybrid EV, I, I think I ask here, what's the torque and speed of the motor generator and the engine for various conditions, cruising, full acceleration, an EV only acceleration, the engine is not operating, the motor is supplying all the traction torque and the generator is acting as a speed governor effectively in our system and along speed to speed control. That's the end of part one. And that's kind of the long part, but it's kind of the fun part for us power and machines people. And now we'll have the, the shorter part on power and machines as well. I'm just looking at the time here, Sergio. Are we doing okay? Well, I'll continue with time, assuming we're fine. Uh, so in, in 
Sorry, John. Uh, my my mic was muted. So yeah, we, we can continue. All right. Yeah, this this will be shorter. It's kind of but it's fun. It, it's it's holistic for us as as power people. Well, I'll keep going. Part two is chapter six to ten. Is so chapter six? I introduce traction machines. You know what are they? Well, what we to do and how do we usually talk about them? We'll briefly touch on that. Then I go on to the DC machine for a particular reason. It's easy to explain a DC machine to a high school student, a freshman, a sophomore, and it's the place to start in talking about traction machines. And then we go from there to the beloved machine of Nikola Tesla, the induction motor, and from there to the machines of the 80s and 90s, which are the surface permanent magnet and IPM machines. But what we want to do in all these sections with all these machines, we know from our vehicle in chapter two, we know the torque and speed that we require from the machine. What we're now going to do is specify, understanding the machine, what the voltage and current is going to be, be that we'll supply to the machine, such that we can start to understand what we want the power electronics to do. And again, in this section, I use a lot of information from uh, Arc Ridge and Oak Ridge, uh, or sorry, Argonne and Oak Ridge National Labs. There's some wonderful information there. Earlier on the battery stuff, there was a lot of nice stuff from Idaho National Labs as well. There are, I suppose, as I look at it, there's, there's two broad classes of AC machines. There is the asynchronous machine and the synchronous machine. The obvious asynchronous machine is the squirrel cage induction motor and the wound rotor induction motor. The wound rotor induction motor certainly doesn't feature in automotive. It played quite a part in wind turbines for a number of years, but it too has been surpassed by permanent magnet machines. Permanent magnet machines, we have surface permanent magnet machines. I'd expect that SPM or surface permanent magnet machine is being used for wind power more now, but the IPM is the machine of choice for 90% of vehicles. To look at my simple sketches here, so this is me explaining to myself uh, the differences in these machines. We get a spinning magnetic field, which was seen by Nikola Tesla back in the 1870s uh, by arranging three windings and putting in time delayed waveforms and currents into these. And what happens in the, in the induction motor is we, we put these a squirrel cage, this hamster cage in there, voltages and currents are induced and we get torque within the machine. And it's a beautiful machine. The SPM, we don't put conductors onto the rotor, we put magnets along the surface of the rotor. It's technology developed by General Motors and Sumitomo in the 80s, and it's a very efficient machine. It has challenges for electric vehicles in that we can very get very high voltages. So that's why we don't tend to have the SBM in EVs, but they, they are used throughout robotics, whole bunch of applications, often used as generators, and they are used in high power machines. I'll come all the way over to the right. So the, our, per, our surface permanent magnet, that's a magnetic machine. All the way over on the right, we have reluctance machine where we have our spinning magnetic field and a bit like a magnet and a nail or a piece of iron, we lock in the piece of iron and we get it to spin with the magnetic field and that's reluctance torque. Our interior permanent magnet machine, our IPM, is a blend of the SPM and the reluctance machine. We see the magnets are embedded in, they reduce the voltage, we don't have the safety issues, but we see this big open zone here, which is really iron, and that's going to result in a reluctance torque. And interestingly, while we might be a permanent magnet machine at low speed, we're very much a reluctance machine at high speed in our IPM. Here we see some pictures. We have a, a US hybrid production machine, both machines, you know, have similar stators, the IPM and the induction motor. Uh, we see here the rotor of the induction motor, and we see the skew in it in order to smooth out the torque and the aluminum castings at the end to short out uh, the squirrel cage. Uh, down below that, we see the IPMs from Oak Ridge National Labs. Uh, this is the 2007 Toyota Camry. We see the magnets arranged in V-shapes uh, for this eight-pole machine. So it's a lot more compact, it's quite a tight machine, and we get some very high uh, power densities from it and some very high torques. 
But I don't start with the AC machine, I start with the DC machine. The DC machine is very easily explained. Uh, we just, it's, it's resistance of the winding, it's the armature. Uh, but what I use it for then is, once we understand the basic machine, we can talk about saturation. We can get into field weakening. When I started this, I know I wanted to start with the, with the DC machine, but nobody's using a DC machine on monitoring vehicles, except for niche applications. I, I contacted a company, Maxon in Switzerland, because they do very good data sheets. And I said, do you, do you do any nice uh, automotive machines? And said, well, nothing we can really talk or tell you about, but we do, we did do the traction machines that went into 2004 Mars Rover. Now, to my knowledge, they put more machines on the newer Mars Rovers. So they shared that industrial spec with me for the 2004 Mars Rover. And I use that to explain the DC machine and so, but really what we're doing there is we're driving electric vehicle on Mars with a lithium cobalt battery and the solar panels to run it. So it's a fabulous application of a machine and it's a great way to explain um, DC machines and give a, a kind of fun example of, of how to apply them. Very simple equations, a uh, simple equivalent circuit here in steady state. It's got a resistance, a back EMF. We see our key equations here, the torque is directly proportional to current. That's true of any machine in motoring or generating. And back EMF is directly proportional to speed. And the constants of proportionality are equal in, I suppose, what's really an expression of, of Ampere's law and an expression of Faraday's law. The, what's interesting then is, we can know, once we understand that, we can discuss saturation, which is a, a huge factor in machines and, and magnetics in general, but we love it. Without saturation, we'd get a linear relationship between torque and current. But with saturation, at a certain point, we won't get the torque that we're expecting for the current. It'll start to, to smooth out and we'll get reduced torque. And that's our material saturation. We can talk about field weakening, relatively straightforward. I'll come down to the bottom right-hand figure here. So in my basic permanent magnet machine that you all got as toys for your very first Christmas with the, the couple of poles in there and the little brushes and it's fun. Well, we can, if we control that, we can get full torque from that machine, which means that the power will raise with speed until we hit the peak power. And at that point, we've hit the max voltage we can develop in the machine. The back EMF is very close to the supply voltage and no more current flows in there. And because of that, we get a rapid drop off in power and a rapid drop off in torque. And that's the power drop off zone. By introducing field weakening, we can enter the constant power zone. And so in the bottom left, we get constant torque. We get a linear increase in power till we hit the maximum voltage and power lids. But we can keep going with field weakening beyond that. In the case of an induction motor, about 2x. In the case of an IPM, about 4 to 5x. And the torque will drop off, but the power remains constant. And that's a wonderful characteristic of a machine that we can apply in our EVs or anywhere. So that's a DPC machine, and that's why we love it. And so we can then go on to the induction motor. There's a blinding sun coming in here. For those of you who weren't aware, the sun does shine in Ireland every now and then. But with our induction motor, just a, a, this is Nikola Tesla's machine. He talked about it in probably the 1870s, 1880s. And so we start off with that spinning magnetic field, which underpins all our machines. The look in here, well, we, we'll just run through it. Very simply, we have that skewed rotor that we saw earlier. And if we look at the, the, the photograph on the top, we see these, the, the in-rings, these solid aluminum chunks, but we see these little glimmers of lines coming down through it. Those are the rotor bars. And I have show there the sketch of the rotor bar running down through the machine and half of the in-ring as it circles around. So the current is flowing around effectively in a short circuit with a very low resistance to it. And it, it turns out as it spins with the spinning magnetic field, a voltage is going to be induced in it if there's a speed difference or a time difference between the relative motion of the magnetic field and the bar. The voltage is induced, 
with a short circuit, a current is going to flow. If we have a magnetic field, a current, a force will result and we'll get torque within our machine. And you can do your left hand rule on our little sketch in the bottom there. So with the, the, the difference in speeds, we know it's a slip. With that slip, we get a voltage. With the voltage, we get the current. With the current, we get the torque. And we see that the torque is proportional to the slip, is proportional to the magnetic field, is proportional to the currents that are induced. We talk about slip itself, S, which can be a percentage, can be a decimal, uh, it can be a ratio. And it's really it's the ratio of the slip speed, which is the difference between the synchronous speed and the rotor speed, and the synchronous speed itself. Per phase equivalent circuit model of the induction motor is as shown here. It's with very basic phaser analysis, this can be easy worked through by students. So we can do some very fun calculations and extract a whole bunch of information on it. I actually just gave my own students who are juniors in college a quite a, a, a fun induction motor exam. It was all in the induction motor yesterday. I was impressed to how I could uh, how much juice I could get out of this machine uh, for its own exam. A uh, beautiful machine. Uh, so it's easy, just, uh, just like with the induction motor, we say, okay, we're going to use a four pole induction motor with these parameters at 80 kilowatt hours, uh, doing a full acceleration, determine the voltage and current on the machine for these particular conditions. What's the slip, stuff like that. So that's all information we can easily extract and work with in a machine. And we can easily get into field weakening. That said, field weakening is a relatively simpler, even though, and maybe not concept for an induction motor, in that there isn't much changing within the machine. We're just changing the, the slip and how we look at slip. And by playing with the slip, we can introduce field weakening into the, into the machine by default, by causing the, the, the magnetizing flux to reduce as the speed goes up. That, that was the induction motor, lovely chapter. I have a 90 minute exam if you want to take it. But onto permanent magnets, uh, we discussed the, the basic operation of the SPM and then the operation of the IPM. Uh, I, I'm a magnetics guy. I love like to know what magnetics fields do. On the right here, we see the back EMF for the 2004 Toyota Prius from Oak Ridge National Labs. And as a magnetics guy, I, I like to present how do we develop these theoretical waveforms to understand what's going on and why with this um, concentrated winding uh, full pitch uh, machine. Uh, this is a full pitch machine. The, the um, induction mode earlier was a fractional pitch a uh, skewed rotor machine. With our SPM, it's easy to analyze. It just has an inductance that we need to factor in in the per phase world. Uh, when we introduce the D current, what, what really happens is this. We see our, our phasor diagram on the left here, and we see the characteristic plots for the machine on the right. Just at the very top plot, we see that we can get max torque, and then it drops off when we hit field weakening. And we see the power increases, but then we, we can, when we hit field weakening, we can get constant power or, um, yeah, the constant power region. But what we do there is looking at our phasor diagram, we only need the Q-axis current, the vector, vertical, the vertical current at 90 degrees to generate the torque in the machine. We introduce the D-axis current, this negative current in the negative D-axis to field weaken the machine. That causes a voltage to be induced across the synchronous uh, reactants of the machine. And that causes, as the voltage of the machine goes outside the, the voltage laid or the circle that we see here, the D-axis current causes a voltage drop across the synchronous inductance to cancel out that increased voltage drop. And we can then control the machine using the voltages available from the inverter. And that's your field weakening in our SPM. And we see it over here. At low speeds, we don't need a D-axis current. We hit the rated speed. Uh, we introduce the D-axis current. The Q-axis current drops off proportionately to the torque. And the phase current kind of dips, but then increases. And we see in the bottom, we see the voltages. We see the, the D-axis voltage, the Q-axis voltage, the per-phase voltage. But what I'm not showing here is the, the voltage drop across the synchronous uh, reactants due to the D-axis current, which is cancelling out that large uh, back EMF E phase and keeping us within the voltages available. That's our SPM.
Our IPM has these embedded magnets, as we show here. Uh, this is a simple two-pole equivalent. We have our north and our south, and we have our D and our Q-axis currents showing on the stator. Uh, in, we're showing it in the middle diagram B. This is where the magnets are interacting with the current to generate magnetic torque. In the far diagram C, we're seeing the flux is going through the machine, and that's where we tend to get the reluctance torque. And we're showing here at the bottom then, uh, to the left is the D-axis currents and to the uh, flux, and to the right is the Q-axis currents. So we do have the, these FEA models that are up on the website and the instruction on how to use them. It uses FIM, which is a free website. So it's, if you, if you want to try it, it's quite fun to use and quite powerful. The, with the IPM, we do have to look at the two axes, uh, but we can still look at it from a phaser perspective. I look at all my AC machines from a phaser perspective rather than a DQ perspective. I think we talk to our students about phasers, they can understand the phaser, that we're going to put sine waves into our machine. So I work on SPM, IPM and induction motor on that basis and here I apply it to the, D, the IPM and the D and Q axis and how and the impacts of field weakening and all the various operation is on the IPM. We can see that the torque equation here in the bottom left, we can see that we have the magnetic component, the torque is proportional to the Q axis current, and we have the reluctance portion where it's proportional to the product of the D and Q axis current and the difference in the inductances between them. And we see here the phasor diagram. So again here, we can, for a particular torque and speed, we can start to determine the voltages and the currents and D and what's going on in the D and Q axis. What I, uh, there's some great data again available from Oak Ridge National Lab where they're testing these induction motors. So what I've done is we see an example plot in the left, bottom left here where high currents are put into the machine, the torque is measured for the stencil torque, where they physically spin the rotor locket, measure torque and spin it another couple of degrees and, and, and uh, characterize the machine in that. I discuss in this chapter how to extract key information, the, the, back, the, the machine constant, the difference in inductances and kind of work with this to build up an understanding of the machine. We do model this, we see the simulation using the FIM models, which I discussed earlier on the right here. And we get, it's, they're, they're kind of fun to discuss. And this is our, 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 takes us into the D and Q axis, which I then discuss in a small bit of detail at the end of chapter 10, all of us in machines know that we have to talk about D and Q, but interestingly, there isn't a consistency, there is the unitary, there is looking at it from a, a current transformation. Um, there can be root threes and root throughs, and every kind of factor is worked their way in there. So we do, I talk about, I think, three different approaches at the end and how to translate the torques and the currents, uh, in particular for the, the IPM. It's a relatively easy machine to understand from a DQ perspective. It takes us into power electronics, we're almost there. Um, a topic we all know and love. Uh, chapter 11 on nice, non isolated, chapter 12 isolated, 13 on inverters, 4 on chargers, 15 on control, all deserving three hours each, but we can't do that. And electromagnetism that deserves as much as the rest combined, but again, we won't do that. DC DC converters, I'll skip ahead. Uh, we see here a diagram from uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. And we can see all the power electronics and machines working away onto the 2010 Toyota Prius. We have a 200 volt nickel metal hydride battery, and we have a bi-directional DC, DC uh, also known as a boost converter, taking the DC link up to between 200 and 650 volts. We have filter capacitors online, and then we have a three-phase inverter that will control the motor and another three phase inverter that'll control the generator. So lots of IGBTs in there, no silicon carbide, controlling motors, generators, and battery interface. This is our basic uh, uh, buck converter. And we see our switch or diode or inductor. We have parasitic inductances. We're going to need high voltage and low voltage capacitors. And then we're coming, we could be taken from a low voltage source to high voltage or vice versa. We see a diagram here, which I, if I'm correct, it's a Ford Fusion hybrid electric vehicle. 
uh, image. We see in the top slot is where the switch and diode are. Next to that is the capacitor, which is a big chunky component, and below that is the inductor. So not only do we have to discuss the switch to diode, but we really have to pay attention to the sizing of the inductors and capacitors. And we'll briefly touch on that. We generate all the equations. It's kind of fun, and for high voltage, it is relatively straightforward. Continuous conduction, um, uh, boundary conduction mode, discontinuous conduction. Just look at all these. They're, they're, they're quite fun to analyze. We have the currents that are flowing in the inductor. We see what's in the switch, what's in the diode, what's in the high voltage capacitor, what's in the low voltage capacitor. And we can start to put RMS, average, max and min on all currents in all components. And with that, we can start to specify the power converters and the passives power semiconductors and the passives. A simple example, this is based on the 2004 Toyota Prius. A hybrid EV requires a 20 kilowatt bidirectional converter to generate a 500 volt DC link from the 200 volt nickel metal hydride battery. The switching frequency is 10 kilohertz. Determine the component parameters in order to have a 28% current ripple ratio on the inductor and a 0.5% voltage ripple ratio on the high voltage capacitors. Determine the various uh, component currents. Determine the, the size, the IGBTs and diodes. Determine the hotspot temperature, size your inductors and capacitors. We can do all of that. Our IGBTs. Uh, on the left-hand side here, we have a plot of uh, voltage drop, uh, conduction drop uh, on the x-axis versus current on the right. And we see we can model that by a, a knee voltage and then an equivalent resistance uh, from collector to emitter. And on the right, we see the turn off and turn on energies for a representative IGBT uh, turn on uh, at 125 degrees and 150 degrees. We'll typically design for a max of about 125 degrees. It's nice to know what's happening at 150 degrees, but we don't want to go there. And knowing the power loss for our currents and voltages, we can then, knowing the, th the thermal characteristics of the semiconductor, we can determine the junction or hotspot temperature. Silicon carbide is coming along. When I started the book, it hadn't. And I was sticking, we were sticking to production technologies. But Tesla brought out the Model 3 with silicon carbide inverters. So I uh, worked in some representative silicon carbide. Our carbide is not an IGBT, it's a MOSFET technology is what we put in there. And it can be simply mo modeling conduction mode by an RI squared loss. The, and the um, a relatively simple, you know, turn on and turn off losses. The, the kind of challenges with silicon carbide does cost there is um, EMI, just very fast switching. We're looking at switchings that are 10 times faster than what I'd have been looking at in the 90s with IGBTs. So phenomenal technology as well, silicon carbide. Simple example here, size your inductor, size your capacitor. We're giving you some key magnetic and electrostatic uh, parameters to do both. The capacitor is with uh, polypropylene, I think, uh, with a 2.2 dielectric. And our inductor there is 1.3 Tesla, so that is silicon steel, to my knowledge. And silicon steel would have been on the earlier Prius. Uh, it then went to powdered iron. And of course, we all know and love ferrite and use it all the time. That takes us to isolated DC-DC converters. Uh, why do we need isolation? We need safety. We need efficiency. We need multiple outputs and we have high voltage gains, and we really need to take advantage of our transformers to do that. We have three main families that I can see. There's a buck derived, which is a forward or a full bridge or push-pull converter. There's buck boost derived, which is flyback, and there's resonant. Just to briefly touch on one of these, and I'm going to start. Over here in the top left-hand corner, we see the buck converter, and we see there's a diode inductor, capacitor and load, we switch and I think, if I want to put in transformer isolation into that, I just shift over to the right and we put in a transformer, we move the switch, we have to add an additional diode to get all this to work and we keep the same, our, our output stage with the diode inductor capacitor and resistor. For the practical forward converter, I need to demagnetize the winding and so we need to add a tertiary winding with a, with a inductor in there, D3. 
that's our, our basic um, how we move from a, a buck to a forward. Interestingly, I didn't include the flyback. Just to, I briefly talked about it in the appendix uh, because it isn't a powertrain and it doesn't carry us. It doesn't uh, carry us down that path. But I expect whenever I get to the the next version, uh, which will be a while, I will introduce the flyback because I, I do love it and it's based on the buck converter, which is kind of wonderful. We see here the uh, the moving on from the forward to the full bridge. The very top one here is a center tap transformer rectifier. A full bridge converter. This is what we might use for a low voltage converter. Of course, we see diodes in there. We could use shunts. If I'm using it for 12 volts, I might consider using a synchronous rectifier. Below that, we see a, a, a another bridge that is uh, a, a full bridge with a full bridge rectifier, which of course we can use for a, I have a high voltage charger. If I'm at six kilowatts with a 400 volt battery, the current's low. There's no problem with using a full bridge. I don't have to center tap. Um, we use the same kind of technologies there to feed it. So again, that's a buck derived topology. My own uh, years, many years on wireless and inductive, we use Reslin technologies. In modern wireless converters with uh, greater spacing between the primary and secondary, it's even more resonant topologies. And I briefly uh, address that and discuss that. And there we're, we're trying to overcome the high leakages of the transformer by, by allowing the system to resonate and still get high efficiencies and not blow the hell out of every device. So wonderful technology, the, the resonant topologies. And um, yeah, just to hear a little bit more definition so i'll skip that slide that takes us on to traction drives and three-phase inverters so we we can we'll see in a moment we'll go from a buck to a three-phase inverter here i uh, just introduce it talk about modulation schemes sinusoidal modulation the benefit of adding a third harmonic adding the third harmonic to a sinusoidal effectively emulates space factor modulation and then of course we can over modulate and we have done and do all these things on electric vehicles. And of course, what we have here is a is a three phase. It's a six banger. You can use any term you want to describe it to generate, go from a DC to three phase AC. Here we see a single pole feeding off the DC link. We have an upper switch, lower switch, upper diode, lower diode, just like a bi-directional DC, DC, except we're going to have three of them. And we're feeding an inductive load, either the inductance of the induction motor or the IPM. We have a pole voltage of A or pole voltage of phase B or line voltage, which then will be AC. And lo and behold, we'll get beautiful three-phase sinusoidal voltages flowing into our system. So that's our, our basic three-phase inverter. We skip through. Uh, what I kind of loved about this was I like to figure out what's going on with the passives. And um, there's a couple of very good papers published in a number of years back. And it's just, uh, I, I enjoyed extracting from those papers what the high voltage DC link currents were and what the currents are in the high voltage capacitor. So that's what you see here. The very bottom current here is for a particular phase voltage, phase current and power factor flowing into the machine. What's the high voltage capacitor current? And so remember now, from our, from our vehicle, we extracted torque and speed. From our machines, we extracted uh, voltage and current. And now we're feeding those voltage and currents being fed to machine directly back into our power electronics. And that, of course, allows us to size, um, uh, determine power losses and size capacitors and everything to do in our system. So that's that wonderful uh, chapter 13 in a very short time. Uh, Battery charging, only five to six years of my life on this and more, and you'll now get it in probably two minutes. Uh, we look here, I look here at the basic requirements for a charging system, the charging architectures, the grid voltages, frequencies, and wirings, the charger functions, the charger standards and technologies. We have already discussed isolated DC DCs. We know a full bridge can be applied for a six kilowatt isolated to charge a battery. We talk here about the boost power factor uh, control or not control, power stage. Here we see the, the, the certainly the, the, the dominant um, connection topologies uh, in the US, we typically see SAEJ1772. To the right of that, we see the VDE 
connector, which is also known as the Minicus connector. At the bottom left, we see the Chadamo, and then we see the Tesla connector. Certainly, I, I think what we're seeing is a standardization uh, in parts of the world using the Minicus connector with the SAE high power. And Chadamo, I think, is struggling, and Tesla certainly, I, I believe in Europe, has been moving over to the Minicus, uh, the, the SAE combo, as we call it. And um, I haven't looked at what's going on in the US, but I'll check when I'm there next month. What do we want our conductive system to do? Well, we're going to go from the grid, which is about 60 hertz, bring live and neutral any earth work. We'll come through a break and do an RCD or residual current disorder in the field called a growth instructor. Coming into an EMI filter, I spent years at EMI. We cannot live a power electronics world and automotive without EM. Uh, with full bridge rectifier, we have our, uh, our power correction stage, and then we run into our, our bridge, um, uh, full bridge isolated stage going into the battery pack. Very simply, then we can start to put some equations on this again. The differences from what before is we're like using a red silicon foot for the, the power switch. Um, the error, I know this happened, there should be a MOSFET. Uh, I just swear. Likely a MOSFET is powered by diode. Pretty competitive to technology. With a power powder or an inductor, uh, a, a uh, polypropylene master and a, a high filter, a plain old 60 hertz rectifier front end, some lovely stuff in the EMI stage. Uh, through the numbers, we calculate, um, we derive equations here that describe the um, voltages and currents in the inductors with diode, so we can size these components for our silicon carbide dominations. And that was our year of life in about two minutes. Control of droids, we have to do it all the time. We've already done it for the electric vehicle. I can, uh, we talk about having a torque loop and a speed loop. In a car, the speed loop is closed in our brain. The torque loop is closed uh, in, in, in the vehicle itself. We, we can show then in sync if we have, if we accelerate our vehicle using a permanent magnet DC machine, we run into power cutoff and we can never get to the speed we're looking to. At the very end, we introduced our field weakening and we can get to the speed we want to get to. So it's it's lovely. We're linking the field weakening with the applicant with the control. Chapter 16, my labor of magnetism, self-inductance, hard for a magnetic transformers, electromechanical energy problem. Lovely night timing. And that brings us to the final slide. Uh, if you're a member of the IEEE and want to buy this, you can get a 85% discount on the Wiley site for the book. If you're not, you can get a 20% discount with the code. If you speak Chinese, you can buy the new Chinese language. It's coming out any day. It'll be out this month. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hayes at ucc.ie. And I'd like to thank uh, Sergio Vidal, Garcia Oliveira, and all at the Brazilian Power Electronics Society for hosting the presentation. So that's enough for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, John. Uh, yeah, it's not so easy to pronounce my name, the large name. Or, <laughs> uh, again, uh, Professor John, uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent uh, webinar and uh, extremely uh, uh, current in the uh, up-to-date uh, topic. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, mainly the first and second part of uh, your presentation have uh, uh, improved uh, the power electronics engineers' understanding of the traction system as a whole. Um, we we can start some some questions that uh, the, our audience put. Um, uh, <laughs> First one from uh, Max Borges. Uh, he asks, uh, it is true that only advanced of a few cell 
electric vehicles is in the refueling speed or mileage recover per minute versus uh, versus uh, a full electric vehicle it, sorry is it true um <clears throat> sorry uh, the I suppose the advantage of the fuel cell compared to the battery electric is it's faster to get the fuel onto the vehicle and we're looking at commercial vehicles which ideally we want to use for 24 hours a day so the less time refueling the better this is hydrogen you know where does it come is it as green um can we distribute it but for large for buses for things like that it's really sensation if i'm working out a long beach or a large harbor with a lot of these vehicles i can do it and the the powertrain efficiency efficiencies yeah, the, the 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 fuel cell efficiency is is low compared to a battery. I'm not sure if I answered the question correctly. I'm not. I might have misunderstood it. But react thirty hours. That answer it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, there are some uh, knowledge and uh, uh, there is comments about the excellent presentation that you did. Uh, Marcelo Vinicius de Paula, a very good presentation and also book. Congratulations and thank you, Professor Hayes. Um, Professor Carlos Henrique Lafon, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, Professor Carlos has a question. What about the control technique of traction inverter for achieving torque and speed requirements? Yeah, uh, th that's an interesting one. Um, and, and back in the old days, when we were doing induction motors, we would have mapped the optimum slips versus speed in order to get our, our max torques and powers from it. So we kind of had a, a large signal. And then, of course, we're counting the, the currents to, to, to feed in and achieve those slips and stuff. Um, the What I'd say is, if I go back to the mid-90s, those current loops, interestingly, were analog current loops. As we moved into the late 90s, those all became digital current loops and quite comfortably have been ever since. Uh, with the... The I suppose as I as I look at it, it's all digital. Space we're using B controllers to control D and axis cars. We're doing axis transformations to go from three phase to two and back again. Um, it's it seems like it's all pretty standard technology. I was in a discussion on IPMs last week, and again, the IPM is a complex animal. In we need to know particular torque and speed what the ID and IQ are going to be and do we map that out and then the de develop the loops to control those I's and D's. So we so controlling it in that mode, controlling voltage mode. They're, they're all challenges, but they're clearly all being successfully addressed and have for quite a while. Thank you, John. And there is a other question from Professor Gierry Valtric from Santa Catarina uh, Federal University. What is the subject in the electric vehicle field which has the highest, highest research demand nowadays for power electronics uh, guys? In your opinion, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> well, if I just, I, I just go about how the vehicle is evolving, we're seeing wide gap, band gap devices, you know, GAN with applications in some areas, low voltage. We're seeing high voltage. Silicon carbide is enabling high voltage. We're seeing 800 volt uh, ICS. Um, I, think, uh, I think Hyundai are 100 volts. So we are seeing, I won't say the revolution, the, the revolution was. The evolution coming in from gap. And then what happens, having been in this business for 30 years now, every time a new technology comes along, you have to go back and evaluate it. 
that we'll be doing to the faster sin makes sense. How are we going to be? Christ look like? How do we say? So it's it's all the bread and product stuff. But yeah, when I apply machines, those magnets, yeah, batteries, yeah, it's getting used to all batteries and then where batteries and power electronics engineers specifically are, are playing a, a, a greater role in society. It's kind of shocking, really, but it's fun. Thank you, John. We are uh, facing some uh, audio troubles, but uh, let me one more comment. Thank you, Professor John Hayes. I saw your YouTube video about Tesla company electric engineer and how it works and why they are different from Nissan Leaf, for example. So, so the question to you, how is the leaf from the vehicle? Yes. Yeah. Um, I suppose primarily is uh, different. Uh, the Tesla back, like the Nissan Leaf back, is, there was a constant and and um, Mitsubishi. Uh, they didn't have this power density. The original battery was lithium cobalt. Uh, is typically used a lot of nickel. Uh, that can potentially be more unstable with a higher energy density. So that's the first thing on the batteries. The inverters, they're all AGBTs, so are, or would have been up until silicon carbide. The machines, uh, the LEAF would have gone to IPM and Tesla up until the last couple of years would have been uh, induction motor. The real advantages then, Tesla would have um, more aerodynamic files, uh, kind of fancier, faster vehicles, higher power, uh, very good liquid cooling or induction motors. Um, but the, yeah, the, the key differences are just the choice of machine. But with time, with time, Tesla adopted the IPM, the same that Toyota and Nissan and General Motors have. So that's that's argument has been sorted. And for semiconductors, I think Tesla were the first to silicon carbide. We'll see companies roll in as well. And threes, uh, looks like LG Kim and Panasonic, Samsung have are all um, some version of nickel called, uh, um, is it uh, manganese or NCM or NCA away from cobalt and originally had. Uh, Sergio, can I do a question? Oh, well, all right. Okay. Uh, congratulations for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to know what uh, we can expect about the future developments on battery systems, battery technology. technology. Well, I, I, I've been astonished about the developments in the last 20 years of Greece. Uh, lithium ion has a long ways. If the lithium ion battery and general EV have hydroelectric general far more than EV1. Um, there's a lot of optimization going on. There's a lot of discussion and work on solid batteries. Cautious on any or revolutionary changes. We have to realize that the lithium ion battery evolved about a hundred years after the nickel batteries, which came decades after lead acid batteries. Change comes slowly. We're seeing faster change, uh, but we're seeing a lot of challenges, and we know that there's challenges in manufacturing carbon emissions, sourcing of materials. But is there a silver bullet and everything is going to be different with a new battery technology? I don't see that happening. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, 
Thank you, John. Uh, one question about uh, what's your opinion uh, or what is, in your opinion, what to expect from wireless power, power transfer applied to EV chargers? There's a series on it. I'm I'm curious. I like I I spent five to six years of my life wireless inductive resonant charging. Uh, and when I went into academia, I didn't focus that much on it because I figured I'd spent a lot of time on it. But I I do see it it, it has attractions, but it has limitations. Nikola Tesla worked to transmit power there's challenges of transmitting power now we're overcoming those challenges uh with semiconductor and and but resonant topologies come with their own challenges uh the distances we're going to see but it could be driven by just consumer preference do you know can i just simply pull up park my back and not have to worry about plugging it in just a lot to be said for that if I'm living like you last year in Wisconsin and I, in very cold weather, um, it's nice to just be able to drive and not to worry about plugging or unplugging the car that it'll self-charge. But interestingly, we're not seeing vehicles coming out on a grand scale. We're not seeing Tesla move into it in, 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 in a great way. So I, I, I'm curious. It, it's still evolving and the technology has come a long way. Uh, and from a consumer convenience perspective, it's 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 it does have a role and will play part in in the water world. Uh, Professor Demersiu has more questions from from you. Yes, uh, John, are you uh, let's say optimistic? about autonomous driving in the near, near future? So, can you repeat that, please, to Marcel? <clears throat> about autonomous driving. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I stick to the power electronics. Um, I expect autonomous driving will happen. It probably won't happen as soon as expected, but it will happen. I think there will be a societal interest in it succeeding. So I, I expect within my lifetime that we'll have significant autonomous driving. For for many, I, I, I was surprised years ago when I started the book. So it's, I remember 20, 2014, I just started writing and it was Christmas and I was walking, coming up a hill and electric car came down to me in a cell leaf so that's fine i'm used to that there was a hybrid i'd seen earlier there was a a friend of mine who lives down the hill came along in his electric bike and this was a man in his 70s with gout issues and walking issues and the electric bike gave him a ability to move around independently that he wouldn't have without the electrification especially with the hills Christmas Day, I met a lad coming up and General Motors bought the company that you stand on it and it pulls you along. Um, what's the technology? The, um, oh, uh, I forget the name of the technology, but this was a lad who had severe physical challenges he couldn't walk and yet he could stand on this device and then bring him up the hill and carry him around autonomous driving is going to have a similar effect for those who are not able to drive it will be life affirming it will be life will be liberating so for that particular reason i expect it to happen more than anything else okay thank you professor john uh, <clears throat> professor humberto Pinheiro from Federal University of Santa Maria has a question. Uh, are there encoders are encoders used in electric vehicles? Encoders? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean your induction motor needs an encoder. So that's that's 
GM EV1 had an encoder, your Tesla vehicles had an encoder for the induction motor. For, for the IPM, you're interested not in an encoder because you need to know the position of the magnets, you need a resolver. You need to know exactly where the North Pole is and the South Pole is. With an induction motor, you don't care. You just want to know the speed. So, another yes. Question. They... Another question from Professor Cassiano from Santa Maria. What's your, your opinion about, about V2G application? About which application? V2G, vehicle to breathe. Yeah, I, I, again, I expect we'll see that in the next decade. I, I think there is. John, sorry. Uh, I, I would like to uh, uh, improve the, the question uh, because there are other uh, persons interested in the vehicle to grid and vehicle to home. You can uh, extend your okay. opinion, all right? Professor Joselito from St. <coughs> Catarina State University. Both, I think, I am, I, I'm expecting to happen and kind of look forward to them. What we're seeing, um, no, I, I don't see it in Ireland, but if I was in California, we had an earthquake, or I'm in Japan and we have, you know, a, a natural disaster, which we know these things happen. It's, we now have a case where our electric vehicle uh, has about a week of energy on board to supply a house. So there's significant energy on board for both battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles. So there's no particular reason that a vehicle can't be used to power a household. And the same way we are, as we move to more green energy, the part of the drive I see in Europe is to put electric vehicles onto the grid such that the wind power, which is intermittent, can be consumed by those batteries. At the same time, if the wind power is um, uh, intermittent, we, we can very well use the batteries to provide power back to the grid. But I, I would see, I would see it being more useful to have power energy available on the vehicle to power a household, uh, like, you know, versus selling it back to the grid. I, I can see the advantage of that. You know, if you have wind or solar and it's intermittent, then you can store it during the day and use it at night or put it into your car. It'd be nice to take it back. And all we need to do that is a relatively low power bidirectional power stage. Thank you, John. Uh, we have one more uh, question. Uh, uh, in your opinion, there, uh, what what are the main limitation on semiconductors that requires the use of other converter topology? Is a question from uh, Douglas Heiss from uh, Blumenau University. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, there's an interesting perspective there that. I was doing some work with uh, Opel in Germany and dealing with quite a brilliant engineer there over 10 years ago. And his perspective was that topologies didn't really matter. Advances in our world comes from semiconductors. We went from the SCR to the bipolar, to the MOSFET, to the IGBT, to white band gap. And we do work kind of sexy topologies in the meantime, but they, they tend to be band-aids until we get to the improved semiconductor and then the technology simplifies again. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, but we, I mean, all the topologies we look at, three, uh, three phase inverters, six bangers, nothing new there, switches and diodes, uh, uh, isolated power conversion, uh, forwards based on the book, flyback based on the boost book or book boost, uh, resonant topologies. Resonant is interesting. Um, like I found with inductive or like you find with wireless today, the only way you can do that is you need to resonate to live with the leakage inductance. But otherwise, would we be using 
snubbers and clamps and all of that. I don't see that happening much anymore. The, 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 there was a time when we used a lot of clamps and snubbers in high voltage converters, but silicon carbide is, is kicking those out the door again. So simple topologies with good semiconductors seems to be the, the key. I'm trying to avoid the sun here. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor John. Uh, I think we have no more time, and uh, I would like it, uh, to uh, thank you and for your time, knowledge, and for sharing it with us. It was a great presentation and an excellent topic. Uh, Professor Demisio, uh, if you want to uh, talk something, please. Uh, I just would like to congratulate Professor John Hayes for his presentation. It's an excellent tutorial for the students. And uh, I'm willing to, to buy your book. I'll look into that. <laughs> Me too. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, congratulate our uh, TechPoint Omni uh, PHB Solar supplier, sponsor companies. And uh, remember all participants to uh, submit to uh, COBEP, our Brazilian conference. And I'd like to invite, to invite uh, Professor John Haynes to uh, submit a paper uh, for our, our journal too. Um, Sergio, thank you so much for inviting me. I, I enjoy talking to, to you all in Brazil. It's been 23 years since I was last there, so it's nice to be there virtually. Um, and yeah, no, I, I, I enjoyed the dialogue and the chance to present and it, um, yeah, it's, it's fun. To, it, for power electronics people, we're a bit geeky. We like to talk technology, but the car gives us a way to talk to people that makes it quite entertaining and fun. So I, I thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for your, for your support, uh, De Marcel and Sergio. And uh, yes, please send on about the um, send on about the, the the journal there. And yeah, that would, is if it's in English, I can work. My sister in law is Brazilian from from Rio, so we can also handle that. But it might be difficult coming from a dentist. No, no, but you can uh, write in English, yeah. No, no oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's cool, okay. Okay, it would be a pleasure. So, thank you very much, Sergio. We we will meet in person someplace. Oh, uh, for sure, for sure. I, thank you, John. It uh, uh, was very nice. And uh, uh, now in Portuguese, uh, uh, eu gostaria de agradecer a participação de todos uh, que, que aqui estiveram conosco. Uh, Em nome da Sobraep, agradeço os nossos patrocinadores também e os convido novamente, como o professor Nemesil fez, a submeterem seus artigos para a nossa sessão especial sobre é, mobilidade, conversores aplicados à mobilidade, e também a participarem da nossa, a, do nosso congresso, né? a também conhecerem mais da sociedade, quem sabe é, virarem sócios da nossa sociedade, E, e é isso, desejar a todos é, uma ótima semana, com segurança, com é, saúde, com felicidade e prosperidade a todos. É, obrigado, então, é, pela participação. E aqui a gente encerra mais esse evento da Associação Brasileira de Eletrônica Potência, é, em conjunto com o nosso é, é, grupo de trabalho lá... É, da Sociedade Brasileira de Automática, professor Pomilho, professor Marafão, que são da nossa sociedade, que estão lá é, liderando esse, esse grupo. Então, obrigado a todos, é, fiquem bem. Uh, thank you, professor uh, John, and uh, we, we close this session. Uh, obrigado. Uh, uh, okay. Thank John, you, you, can, you can wait.